All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by Ori Peleg, an assistant professor at CU Boulder. Before we get into today's conversation, be sure to take a moment to head over to Apple Podcasts or your listening platform of choice. And if you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star rating and review. Ori, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Sam. Excited to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, We're going to be talking about your research into collective communication in insect swarms. Uh, And I've already learned that there are multiple species of firefly. Never occurred to me uh, that that was the case. Uh, We'll dig into that uh, and a lot more. But before we do, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background and uh, how you came to work with machine learning. Sure. Um, So my background is pretty interdisciplinary. And even within the realm of uh, interdisciplinary backgrounds, I think it's a little bit all over the place. So bear (laughs) with me. Um, I started with an undergrad in uh, computer science and physics, uh, then moved to a master's in physics, where I studied um, soft materials uh, using computational techniques. Um, I then moved to Uh, So that was in Israel, where I grew up, and then I moved to Switzerland for a PhD in material science, um, where I started applying some of these uh, computational techniques to biological materials, Um, usually small things like uh, proteins and how they fold or how they interact with each other to build larger complexes. Um, And then I, uh, for the postdoc, I made a switch. Uh, So first of all, I moved to the U.S., um, I spent time in uh, a few departments, first in chemistry and then in applied math. So you get my drift on <laughs> the, all over the place. Um, <laughs> and I made a big conceptual switch to study um, materials that are on a larger scale, on a level of a super organism instead of small proteins, um, uh, because I was really interested in animal behavior. And it was a really nice uh, segue into that. And after that, I um, landed in Colorado, where I am today. Um, I'm officially in the computer science department, and I have a joint appointment with the Biofrontiers Institute, which um, is a very interdisciplinary institute, bringing people from many departments to study problems in biology. Um, And I'm also associated with the Santa Fe Institute for uh, Complex Systems. Uh, So it's a nice spot to be uh, for people with background like mine, where we apply lots of different disciplines to um, understand problems in in biology. Um, And naturally, since I'm in the computer science department and we use a lot of computer science, we also use a lot of machine learning techniques for analyzing our experimental data, um, classifying behavior, um, and also in the simulation and agent-based models that we're using as coupled technique to understand animal behavior. Okay. Okay. You said something interesting in there. Um, You kind of characterize your work now or your work with kind of systems of animals as large scale materials. Um, Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So um, we, um, I'm specifically referring to honeybee swarms. Um, One particular phenomenon that they, or, or behavior they exhibit is that many, many bees, tens of thousands of bees, connect their bodies by holding hands or legs or whatever they can. Um, And they create these really, really large materials that are completely made of honeybees. And they're extremely adaptable. They can suspend themselves from tree branches or rooftops, you know, lots of different surfaces. Um, And that was the, then I guess an analogy for, or a, microscopic manifestation of uh, biological material. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I've been fascinated by this whole idea of swarming behaviors for a while. I was initially introduced to it in the context of trying to emulate swarming behaviors that occur naturally in distributed computing systems. Uh, And this idea that you can take kind of the, you know, a set of simple primitives or rules and have each system or each participant in a, a larger system kind of implement these simple primitives without any knowledge of what anyone else is doing. And then you have these kind of emergent behaviors uh, across the the broader system. Um, it's super fascinating stuff. How did you 
like what was what was kind of your entry way into thinking about these broader problems these these kind of systems so first of all yes I, I very much I can very much relate to that uh, connection to distributed algorithms and distributed hardware and swarm robotics although we don't work on it specifically in my lab I think that we have so much to learn from nature from um, swarms that had the privilege of eons of evolution to perfect some of these collective communications. I, I find it fascinating. Um, and I guess I kind of expanded, um, you know, I started with the um, honeybee swarms materials that I just mentioned, uh, but there are just so many interesting things that the bees do, which we observed while performing experiments on, on the honeybee swarms. Um, for example, they use chemical communication um, where one B uh, produces a chemical signal, but because it's so, it's very volatile, it can decay very rapidly in time and space. So other bees actually serve as uh, signal amplifiers. They stop at a certain distance and they generate a signal and then another bee does this and another bee so they can uh, transmit the signal over large distances. Almost um, sounds like spiking neurons. It's the, I think there's a deep relation to um, neurons and their synchronization or activities. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so when I opened up my own lab um, at CU Boulder, I sort of, you know, took some time to think what would be cool new ideas and new systems to study. Um, and yeah, the, the honeybees was a kind of natural because I was already working on it, but the fireflies is another um, beautiful example of collective synchronization in nature where um, individuals flash on off. Um, and it's probably as close as it gets to computer language in the natural animal communication in nature, uh, because it's such a simple signal. It's very similar to Morse code. So I saw some, I had an intuition and gut feeling that these would be cool systems to to focus on. Awesome, awesome. And let's dig into that uh, a bit more deeply. You presented on that uh, at this past CVPR some of your research in that area and the ways that you use machine learning in your research. Let's maybe uh, start by having you expand a bit on the phenomenon that you were observing and trying to characterize, and then we'll get into the way you apply ML to help with that. Okay, sounds good. So, so I'll start with maybe a bit of a broader background about fireflies, since not everybody's familiar with this. So fireflies are, are beetles, and they have an... A, organ in their abdomen that is called the lantern, so it can produce light. It's called light, it's based on chemical reaction. Um, and they use that lantern in order to communicate with each other. Usually it's in the context of um, mating swarms. So that happens once a year where lots of fireflies congregate at a certain area, and then males would um, advertise themselves by producing a flash pattern. Uh, so a certain sequence of flashes on and off. Um, and then if a female perceives that signal and likes it, and there's lots of different ways to understand what, uh, what a female likes, she would respond also in a species-specific pattern. Um, so these patterns, the important issue about them is that they're species-specific. Uh, each species, and there's thousands of species of fireflies, has its own unique flash pattern. Can imagine that if there is, let's say, one firefly in, in, in an area, if you're just observing one firefly, um, then it's pretty easy to connect the dots. So you know that there's one firefly here. Every time you see a flash that came from that one individual, so you can easily connect the dots um, and kind of construct the flash pattern that this individual performed. But as soon as you have more fireflies and you cannot see them when they're not flashing, this becomes a really hard problem. How do you connect the dots? How do you know which flash came from which individual? Um, in a sense, it's similar to the cocktail party problem, that it's a classical right. problem studied in neuroscience where the idea is that um, you're present in a, in a loud room with many people, but humans are really good at um, focusing on the person that they're speaking to, um, and it seems like fireflies are somehow able to do it as well, but we don't really understand how they do that. So um, we do know that there's 
two main groups of fireflies uh, species. There's fireflies who synchronize their flashes, and then uh, naturally that increases the signal-to-noise ratio of the collective swarm. And there's fireflies who don't synchronize their flashes. Um, so my lab studies uh, both groups. For the synchronous fireflies, the species that we started working with a couple of years ago, um, we try to understand how they synchronize their flashes. So um, there is, um, it's actually a, you know, it's a known phenomena. People have been, knew that fireflies can synchronize their flashes for a long time, but it was kind of dismissed at first as maybe, you know, maybe, maybe people were just imagining it. Um, maybe the, um, <laughs> the observers blinking um, somehow makes it, you know, in when, when they perceive it, makes it look like the fireflies are flashing in unison. Maybe the, the boat, so it was, uh, um, in particular, um, uh, the first synchronous species were, um, were, were uh, observed in Thailand um, on mangrove trees on the banks of a, of a river. So people were on boats or some, another potential hypothesis was that the movement of the boat is maybe um, changing something about the perceived signal. But no, it's uh, after um, several decades of rigorous studies, um, it turns out the fireflies do synchronize their their flash patterns. Um, and there has been lots of mathematical models uh, to explain how this synchronization might occur, but very little um, quantitative experimental data to um, actually validate these models. And that's the gap that me and my lab members um, were, were after. Got it, got it. Before we dig into that, um, kind of returning to the thousand or thousands of species of fireflies, is the species distribution highly geographical or is it the case when I'm walking down the street in July and see fireflies, I'm observing many different species at work? The information about the geographical distribution is a little bit sparse at the moment. Uh, fireflies okay. have been very understudied uh, relative to other insects. But it is known that um, you know some of the uh, uh, species of fireflies do coexist. So it's not that uncommon to walk down the street or maybe in a forest um, and actually observe uh, swarms that contains two species of fireflies. And then the problem, of course, becomes even more interesting because you can have synchronous species and non-synchronous species overlapping, and um, we're I'm really fascinated by how the females are able to interpret those signals and uh, detect their own species. Kind of getting into the experimental part of your work, um, kind of how do you set up those experiments? And I'm imagining that's going to lead us to the role of computer vision. Yes, in the yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, I mentioned that until a few years ago, there wasn't um, um, sufficient quantitative data to validate the models, and um, we wanted to acquire that kind of data. Um, and nowadays, um, actually, with very simple cameras, GoPros, sometimes even with our smartphones, we can capture the very dim light of the fireflies. Uh, it wasn't the case uh, always, so I think that's one of the reasons it hasn't been uh, it has been a bit understudied. Um, so what we do is we go to the field um, uh, with cameras. Uh, so it's a, it's kind of an unusual experience for uh, computer science professors, uh, PhD students, and postdocs. We all go together to the field, which is really exciting. So we get to see the fireflies, um, and we record their flashes. Now, um, in some of the mathematical models that I mentioned before. Um, the, the, the concept is that um, there is some kind of coupling between each agent, um, whether that's a firefly, a person, a heart cell, a, or actually even um, electrons in a, in a superconductor, <laughs> um, they're somehow coupled to their neighbors. That coupling can decay as a function of distance between the two agents, which makes sense. If we think about fireflies, maybe as they get further and further away from each other, they, you know, the light is dimmer and dimmer and they cannot see each other very well. Um, so space is really important. We really want to capture uh, where and when the fireflies um, flash. And to capture the spatial aspect, we need stereo vision. Um, so we have two cameras. And that kind of works like um, our, our own uh, depth estimation as humans. We have two eyes, so we can um, 
capture you know the same objects from two different views and from that triangulate how far away that object is so we do the same with, same thing with fireflies um and stereo vision has been um very um well used so there is actually code to uh to interpret these kind of data um but we extended that method um, a little bit uh, to eliminate cal camera calibration. Camera calibration is one of the most annoying things in stereo recording. Um, you have to go, uh, especially when in the field, um, you have to ca calibrate the cameras both temporally, uh, so make sure that the same frame from each camera view is synchronized, uh, as well as spatially. So you need to know the exact relative positions of the camera. Um, and what we what we did is uh, we could only do this because the firefly flashes are so bright in comparison to the background. We actually use the firefly flashes to calibrate our cameras. Um, so we apply some basic computer vision. We threshold the image to find where the flashes are in both camera views, and then to um, we we solve the alignment and calibration as an optimization problem. Um, so. We find out, for example, how many flashes were recorded from each camera view, and we plot that as a function of time. And then we align um, th th this information from both cameras until they they match. So it's uh, so it's in a sense an optimization problem where the output is what was the temporal difference between the two cameras. And do the cameras always have the exact same field of view or do you also have to account for kind of overlapping but not perfectly aligned field of view exactly they're not perfectly aligned so but we use the um, um the fraction of the the field of view where they do align um so that's a good point and uh, we have to account for that yes and, and so in terms of the optimization problem are you using uh, any particular algorithms to do that or yeah so we're using um um some some well known um, um, I guess optimization code. Uh, some of the codes we usually depending on how many parameters we need to optimize for the temporal aspect. It's really just one parameter, which is the time difference between the camera. Uh, for the uh, spatial arrangement, uh, there's actually more parameters because each camera is um, has a three dimensional position in space. X, Y, Z, and actually it's represented by a three, day, three by three matrix. So we have enough parameter to start worrying about um, using more efficient optimization code. So we, we use a lot in the lab um, a method called um, CMAES, uh, Covariance Matrix Adaptation uh, Evolutionary Strategy. Um, that's a, a little uh, extension of that. It's actually really cool because it's based on biological evolution um, and it's... Um, Calculating the um, uh, covariance matrix that each parameter set is giving you, um, and making sure that the covariance matrix is is large. So when the covariance matrix is large, it means that you're um, more exposed to different uh, um, landscapes on on the function that you're trying to optimize, and less less likely to get stuck in local equilibrium, and more likely to get towards the global equilibrium. That's just one example, um, and there's a few other methods um, that we use, and we haven't invented them. They're really just out of the box methods that people use for for solving optimization problems. Got it. And where does the evolutionary aspect of that come into play? There is uh, in each generation of the optimization code uh, or optimization function, there is basically a for loop, um, and there is a certain number of um, points on the landscape. Uh, each point corresponds to one parameter set. Um, and these points, uh, we kind of keep keep count whether they helped increase the area of the covariance uh, metrics or decrease it. If they helped increase it, then they're more likely to survive the next generation. Uh, and that's where <laughs> the evolutionary aspect comes to place. There is a fitness function to the points on the energy landscape, in a sense. Interesting. Interesting. And on the temporal side, is it, uh, are you doing some kind of like sliding window kind of thing where you're yeah, just trying exactly. to see where, and so once you have that aspect of machine learning is just helping you kind of set up your experiment and know where your cameras are and get them all, uh, aligned. Do you use machine learning further 
along in the research uh, or the experimentation process? So, so that's the main aspect for the data acquisition. And I will just I just want to point out that we don't do it only for ourselves. Uh, we are actually hoping to really um, extend the data acquisition. And there is um, an ongoing increasing attention to Firefly behavior. So we hope to be able to actually crowdsource data acquisition. And for that, uh, eliminating the calibration process is really crucial. Oh, wow. So allowing someone to just download this onto a couple of phones and yeah. put them on a tripod or something and start to collect data? That's that's what we hope to do. And actually, this year we have uh, an amazing group of um, scientists and just Firefly enthusiasts enthusiastic people uh, who are uh, volunteering to help us uh, collect data and we're testing that method. Um, and is the these alignment steps that we're talking about, is that a, a post-processing step or are you trying to do some kind of real-time alignment? So it's actually a post-processing step, although in post-processing it can also be aligned along different windows of the recording. Um, which means that anybody who has a pair of cameras can potentially just record and then send us the data and we can do everything in post-processing. So there's no, you don't need anything else besides cameras and, and tripods. Talk a little bit about what you do with the, uh, the aligned data once you have it. Um, okay, so the, uh, once we have the aligned data, um, there's two main ways that we, we use it. Uh, one is to understand Firefly behavior, how they're synchronizing their flashes, for example. Um, and I can talk more about that. And I'll just mention the other, the other way that we use it is for population monitoring. Um, so as I mentioned, each species of Firefly has different flash patterns. So just by using this recording and tracking the Fireflies in three dimensions, we can reconstruct what was the flash pattern. And from there, we can identify the species of the Firefly using, again, machine learning techniques. And that's important for Firefly conservation, which is has been um, generally neglected um, until a few years ago. Um, and turns out uh, that Fireflies do suffer from a uh, population decline due to climate change and due to light pollution. Um, so there's um, an increasing amount of programs that are trying to objectively characterize the firefly populations. Um, right now, the, the, the way that people measure firefly populations or quantify them is kind of by eye. So they go out to the field and try to count how many flashes they, they see and which species. But that's really hard to do once you have lots of individuals in the same spot. So we hope that our more passive way to record fireflies is, is going to help there. Exactly. Um, it's hard for them to mate when uh, the lights are on, in a sense. They can find each other. They, they, it directly uh, changes the contrast between the firefly flashes and the background. Um, and they definitely flash less when, when it's bright outside. Uh, so in your description of um, the ways that the, the things that you're doing with the data, you mentioned um, identifying the synchronization patterns, identifying the individual fireflies, I guess, in a frame or in, an, in a video um, and kind of tracking their movement through the frame. It sounds like there are a bunch of potential ML applications and all that. Do you use machine learning for those areas as well or more traditional methods? At the moment, we're using more traditional methods like thresholding and um, filling out, um, you know, little holes in the in the flash of the pattern, um, these kind of things. Uh, but, but it doesn't always work, of course, because um, if you're doing classical motion detection, uh, but there's little things that move in the background, like maybe there's a tree and there's a little bit of wind, so the leaves are moving. That can really mess up with, with these classical methods. Um, so our, our next step is actually to use more advanced machine learning techniques to, to track um, the fireflies, which um, has been done a lot with insect swarms. We did it with other um, insect swarms like honeybees. Uh, it seems like it's a possible, possible approach. and um, we haven't done it yet, but we hope to do it uh, as a next step. And I'm imagining that kind of collecting and 
labeling, curating a data set is one of the big challenges to overcome in order to make it all work? That's always a challenge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, preparing the training set basically is always the maybe the most time consuming thing. Uh, so you mentioned honeybees again. Um, talk a little bit more about what you're looking at when you're uh, studying honeybees. Okay, so um, honeybees, totally different uh, animal. <laughs> Uh, let me um, just give you a very brief background. So honeybees live in very, very large, uh, usually congested colonies. Um, there is one queen um, and most of the, um, the rest of the bees are, are female workers. There's maybe 10% um, uh, drone males. Um, and the numbers we're talking about is tens of thousands or you know, even more sometimes for a particular colony. So it's really, really large. And the, the communication there is extremely distributed. It's in, you know, there's a queen, but the queen doesn't really tell them what to do. They make a lot of decision based on local information that they sense around them, either from neighboring bees or from the environment. Um, and they make decisions based on that. And somehow there's a, a lot of uh, interesting emergence behavior, emergent behavior uh, in how they, for example, ventilate their hive, how they maintain mechanical stability as a swarm. These are the, the swarm, the, the materials made of bees that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, they do a lot of interesting things as a collective, as a coherent aggregated group. Uh, but one thing we were interested in was how do they become a coherent group in the first place? Uh, we know that bees can sense the pheromones of the queen. The pheromones are chemical signals that um, they're very volatile. They decay very rapidly in time and space. Um, so bees that are close to the queen maybe have no problem to sense these signals, but bees that are further away um, are going to struggle. Um, so that's, that was one of the problems, the first problems that we started working on when I opened my lab. Um, how do bees that are further away... Are pheromones modulated at a, a frequency kind of fast enough for communication? I kind of think of them as uh, uh, a much longer um, kind of wavelength signal. So it really depends on the... the um... Yeah, the half lifetime of, of that chemical uh, signal. Uh, I think you're right that usually it's more, it's less instantaneous than uh, a firefly flash, for example. Um, and it's it's sometimes it's passive, uh, so it's just you know the queen, for example, has lots of pheromone glands on her body. She doesn't really do anything um, active in order to transmit these pheromones. They just kind of diffuse passively from from her body. So I think these are the two main differences. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, so how do far bees that are further away from the queen are able to find her? Um, of course, the, the queen is really important because there's only one queen. She's the only fertile bee, actually, that can lay eggs uh, and help the, the colony uh, maintain its colony size. So um, it turns out that uh, bees can serve as little signal amplifiers. Um, they do something that uh, in the beekeeping jargon is called scenting. Um, so they uh, stick their abdomen upwards and they open up a pheromone gland by um, applying this body posture and they fan their wings. So the airflow draws air across this pheromone gland and they, um, depending on how their body is oriented, in which direction, uh, that also determines the direction in which the signal is going to propagate. So it basically propagates from their head uh, backwards. Um, and we found out doing some preliminary experiments that um, bees use that scenting behavior to inform bees that are further away from the queen. So they're all like little Wi-Fi extenders. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like a little telecommunication network uh, where the bees, um, a bee that senses the pheromones of the queen would stop at a particular distance, start scenting further away from the queen towards the less informed bees and then another bee would come from behind do the same thing and the same thing and the same thing so they create this really interesting dynamical uh network of communication that um is extremely robust and um adjustable also to environmental perturbation so i think it's a fascinating uh, behavior that the bees kind of uh manage to do and we wanted to understand that a little bit better and that's where machine learning came into uh, into the play. So um, we wanted a way to um, classify the behavior of the bees in a high throughput way. 
I mean, we can see by eye that they're scenting, but as you just mentioned, creating these training sets and, and um, marking the bees when they're scenting, that can take a very, very long time. Uh, just to give you the sense, for, for one experiment, we spend months basically um, um, cataloging and classifying the, the behavior of the bees that are scenting. Um, so to overcome that, we use machine learning, uh, where the training set was a collection of um, a, a either snapshots or movies of bees uh, that are performing scenting or not performing scenting. Um, and um, the output is yes or not, or no. Are, are these bees scenting, producing the signal or not? And also in which direction they're scenting. Um, and these are the, the two important um, aspects of that behavior that um, we can then use to better understand why the bees are scenting, how they make decisions about scenting, in which direction they, they usually scent. Um, and um, when, we, when we ran the experiments and the analysis uh, with the machine learning classification of the behavior, we noticed that indeed the bees, the rest of the worker bees, create a global map to where the queen is. Uh, so they all sent in a direction that if you follow all the scenting events, uh, you, um, you would end up where the queen is. Um, and we think that what happens is that they do so so that the further away bees, the less informed ones, can follow these signals to find the queen. Gives another meaning to gradient descent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, uh, endless puns you can use uh, yeah. with, with the bees, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And so how, how do you use the kind of the understanding that you get gained around this network and the directionality of the scenting behavior? Yeah. So um, finding out whether that information is indeed um, leading to the queen, all the scenting direction, that was the first step. That was kind of a proof of concept that um, we found um, an interesting uh, communication signal that really has a meaning. Uh, in, in that case, it's uh, the, the global position of where the queen is. Now we can actually dive deeper. We can um, ask things like, um, how do bees make decisions? How does a bee decide, oh, now I'm going to stop and I'm going to stand backwards, uh, or now I'm just going to follow the signal of the other bees? Um, and from that, um, we noticed a few interesting hints from the experiments. We noticed that bees that are scenting position themselves at a very particular distance from uh, other bees that are scenting. And we can only do that because we have this you know, big data set uh, with the machine learning high throughput analysis. So since we're dealing with a chemical signal that diffuses or has some kind of advection, a particular distance from a source would imply a particular concentration particular concentration of that signal from the source. Uh, if we just think about the classical physical equations of, of diffusion, for example. So that's really interesting. Maybe it means that the bees get triggered by a threshold of concentration of the pheromone. So if the threshold is above a certain threshold, uh, sorry, if the concentration is above a certain threshold, then they start triggering their behavior, their scenting behavior. Um, another thing we notice is that th this, there's a little bit of a stochasticity to that uh, process. So there is the bees have certain probability once they sense that chemical communi uh, chemical uh, concentration above a threshold, then you know maybe 50% of the time they stop sending and 50% of the time they they ignore it. And um, then um, what we did is take these hints from the experiments and we actually plug them into an agent-based model that mimics what the bees do. And uh, we actually, again, used um, optimization uh, strategies or machine learning to explore the parameter space in the agent-based model uh, to find optimalities uh, of the process. Interesting, interesting. Um, going back to the kind of characterizing the pheromone, um, is there... Is there just is there one pheromone or is pheromone uh, kind of a family of chemicals and there are I'm trying to get a sense for the granularity of pheromones as a communication vehicle. Yeah, it's it's actually a fascinating, fascinating field. Um, <laughs> I, I'll, you know, to lower your expectation, I would say we don't really know. We know that there's definitely more than one pheromone. 
and the granularity of different pheromones. Pheromone is kind of like a cocktail of different chemicals, and so it can, you can have different concentrations of these chemicals. Um, different bees within a colony can have different pheromones. Sometimes it depends on their age. Uh, bees from different colonies would have a different combination of uh, chemicals that lead to their, their pheromones. This is how they uh, distinguish between nest mates and non-nest mates. Um, and it's a fascinating uh, olfaction in, in animal communication is, is a fascinating topic that uh, I, th I think it's really not clear what is the right level of granularity um, in bees, but also in other species. So in, in your research, do you ultimately think of it as kind of a binary signal, you know, with maybe some th with regard to some threshold, uh, the bees either, you know, pro propagating pheromones or not? Exactly. Or are you trying to to get to a low? You're not trying to get to a lower level. No, we we um, for simplicity, we're starting as a yeah, as you said, a zero or one. Are they are they producing chemical signals or not? In the future, if um, it ever becomes possible to actually um, measure the chemical concentration of these pheromones, I think it would be really interesting to try to further classify and dig deeper whether different bees have slightly different combination of chemicals and how they affect the um, yeah the behavior of the rest of the swarm. Earlier you mentioned that you were talking about the difficulty of data collection in, in this case as well and you mentioned that you overcame you, it, it sounded like you were saying you overcame that by doing some um, some data collection and some uh, classification. I wanted to make sure that I understood specifically what you're doing. Were you kind of like bootstrapping a broader, you know, something that was able to operate on large scale by doing, uh, creating a, a small scale classifier, like some kind of hierarchical thing? Oh, no, no, uh, not that advanced. <laughs> uh, what we did is we basically prepared a training set. Um, so we had um, a, a set of movies or snapshots of bees that are scenting or not scenting. Th those were hand labeled. Um, and also the body orientation was, was hand labeled. Um, and then we train um, a, either a CNN or an RNN on, on this data in order to get the output, which is yes, no, is this bee sending or not? Um, or uh, and, and if yes, in which direction it is uh, propagating the information to. Got it, got it. Uh, and then you, you're you applying that kind of frame by frame on this these images that you capture and are you creating like some kind of, you know, at each, for each bee, like a point vector of like, if they're sending in what direction, that kind of thing? Exactly. And then what we do is integrate, we take all these vectors and uh, we construct a higher dimensional surface from the vectors are kind of gradients and we use them, we treat them as gradients, we reconstruct the surface. So then high values on that surface should correspond to where the target is. In this case, it's where the queen is. In terms of kind of next steps for both the, the fireflies and the honeybees and any other species that you're investigating? Are there um, things that you're seeing kind of coming down the pike in the, you know, or kind of already uh, established in the machine learning world that you, you know, think are promising for your research and are looking forward to applying? Yeah. So one thing we already kind of talked about briefly was applying more sophisticated machine learning computer vision tools for uh, Firefly behavior. Um, I think that that's absolutely necessary. And um, I think it would help us a lot to get rid of um, environmental noise and capture more flashes. Um, we might also be able to capture something interesting about the movement of the Firefly. So I only mentioned temporal information, but the Fireflies are actually moving. Uh, and when they're moving, they're almost like drawing, you know, a line, a particular, um, particular shape with, with their flashes. So we're really wondering if there's any further information encoded um, in, in the movement as well. And uh, we're hoping to extend our both tracking and also um, species classification based on that uh, and the movement as well. And that wouldn't be unheard of. Don't bees have like communicate via movement patterns or something like that? I think I remember 
reading that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very true. So the bees use the waggle dance um, to inform other bees about a target that is usually further away. Um, so they use the scenting for things that are within a few meters. Beyond that, uh, they're actually using the waggle dance. Uh, that is a slightly, you know, it has slight, slightly different accuracy, but it's fine, you know, for long distances. Um, and the waggle dance basically tells the bees um, that can can perceive that signal um, where is a good source of food or a nest site, um, how far it is, and in which direction they should fly. Um, yeah. So you know, th- there's there's actually. Um, lots of different communication signals in bees that can be characterized with machine learning uh, computer vision tools like the waggle dance. Um, maybe there's auditory signals that they use. And actually, people keep finding more and more um, new communication signals that the bees use. Usually, they're based on um, just a person kind of staring at what the bees are doing and then notice some patterns. But actually, using machine learning tools can be a really powerful way to um, more subjectively um, find find some some interesting new communication methods or signals that the bees use. And that to me suggests kind of a unsupervised type of an approach or clustering approach. Is that something that you've experimented with? Yeah, uh, I'm definitely familiar with the methods. Uh, we haven't tried it on um, the bee communication uh uh, or experiments that we, we work with in my lab, but I think it could be a really promising future direction. Yeah. All right. Well, Ari, thanks so much for taking the time to share what you've been working on and the way you're applying machine learning to study communication and insects. Super fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. It was fun chatting with you. Um, and thanks again for having me.